Tonight I'd like to introduce John Pilger, who many of you will be familiar with. He's been a long-standing investigative journalist. He's made documentaries, um, the most recent of which was a documentary called Inside Burma, which was shown on television not so long ago. He's also made documentaries on Cambodia and East Timor, as well as making uh, films and writing books. So <clears throat> I'd like to introduce John Pilger. Thank you. It's, uh, it's good to be addressing Marxism again. The, uh, the title of this is very loosely The Hidden Power of the Media. It's very loose, but uh, it's meant, I hope, to explain something of how I see the media from inside. Now, some years ago, before the collapse of the Soviet Union, a group of Russian journalists toured uh, Britain and the United States and they were astonished to find after reading all the newspapers and watching all the television that all the opinions were the same on all the vital issues. Now in our country, they said to their host, to get that result we have a dictatorship. <laughs> we imprison people. We tear out their fingernails. Here you have none of that. How do you do it? What's the secret? Well, the secret, of course, is that propaganda in liberal democracies, like America and Britain, is much more thorough than in dictatorships and totalitarian states. No imprisonment is required, no loss of fingernails called for. There is another far more effective way. Unlike totalitarian states, the conformity of information and opinion is insidious. Its sameness implicit, ingrained, and even celebrated. Now, in the former Soviet empire, the promotion of sameness was an obligation that journalists grew deeply cynical about. And like in the West, they knew exactly what they were doing, and the public knew too. In 1977, I went to Czechoslovakia at the time of the, uh, the birth of uh, Charter 77, the resistance movement inside Czechoslovakia, and I met the banned Czech novelist, Zdenadna Urbanik, who told me this. In the East, we have acquired the skill of reading between the lines. In the West, you don't have this skill because you believe you don't need it. But you do need it more than we do because illusions are more effective than the censor at his desk. Now, what he was saying was that, that the abuse of conceptual thought and language and logic that exists in totalitarian states also exists in free society and that only the form and illusions are different. Today there's another dimension to this and it's called technology. Technology seems to have made almost anything possible except truth. And by truth I mean that which is subversive for truth is always subversive. Otherwise, why should governments and their bureaucracies fear it so much and go to such lengths as to suppress it? And when the great American muckraking reporter I.F. Stone remarked that all governments are liars and nothing they say should be believed, he was exaggerating, of course, but not by much. What he was saying was that all unaccountable power is the enemy of truth regardless of its democratic pretensions. Now these days we are constantly told we live in an information society. On the contrary, I believe we live in a media society in which there may appear to be saturation information, but in reality it's information that is repetitive, controlled, and above all safe. When you next read the fashionable word debate, consider the extreme narrowness of its political and economic terms. When you next turn on the TV and radio, or pick up a newspaper, consider all the, the news you don't see and you don't read, news that is by its very nature unwelcoming, threatening, and therefore excluded. In my experience, the most powerful form of censorship is not by commission, the, editor, the, the censor behind his desk, but by omission. 
Leaving, what it, leaving out what it finds unpalatable, the Western media carries more or less the same ideological message, message as the Russian tourists found out. And that is that there's only one way for societies to develop. This is called the free market and it's led by economic growth. Although it has nothing to do with freedom and nothing to do with a true market and nothing to do with the growth of democracy and prosperity for the majority, let alone all. Now, yesterday, the United Nations Development Program released an extraordinary report that showed the enormous divisions opening up in humanity. That the wealth of the world's 358 billionaires now exceeded the annual incomes of half the people on Earth. That since 1970, the provision of clean running water has dropped by two-thirds in poor countries. And that instead of true economic growth that benefits everybody, there is, and I quote, unprecedented jobless growth, ruthless growth, and anti-democratic growth. Strong words for a UN agency. Last night on News at 10, which is the principal source of information for millions of people in this country, there was not a word about this. The main news was Princess Diana suffering depression. It's only 15 million. <laughs> At the bottom of the news was an item on Ireland, which, which presented the British Army and the RUC caught between two warring tribes, an enduring distortion. There was, of course, Nothing about the UN report in the newspapers that between them sell more than any others in this country. The Mirror and the Sun concentrated on the love life of the golfer Nick Faldo. The Mirror's campaigning spirit, however, is not completely lost. Today it begins a campaign to get back Princess Diana's title of HRH. A few years ago, Rupert Murdoch's London correspondent gave us a rare glimpse of how the media high priests view themselves. He described Murdoch as a, a free market Karl Marx. <laughs> Murdoch's empire, he wrote, has always shared one thing with Marxist enterprise. It turns ideas into social and economic experiments. He described Sky Television's takeover of televised football as part of this, and I quote, part of a social and ideological transformation of society in the image of a radical philosophy." Unquote. Now what this means simply is that media giants, that as media giants like Murdoch get bigger and bigger, the way we see much of our own world is distorted often without many of us realizing. For example, when the Disney Corporation recently merged with ABC in America, it marked the further breakdown of the borders between news and entertainment as one arm of the media corporation feeds off, promotes, and protects the other. American popular culture, with its full range from Bambi to Rambo, and its fascination with violence and the vacuous, now crosses these borders freely. Murdoch's empire now has access through satellite to two-thirds of the world's population. Star TV, of which he owns 64%, the satellite TV, stretches from Japan to Turkey, right across China and India. Murdoch claims that direct satellite broadcasting is bringing a new dawn of free information and democracy to the third world and offers, and I quote him, an unambiguous threat to totalitarian regimes everywhere, unquote. Now, until recently, Murdoch's satellite carried BBC television news. And when the Chinese regime complained that unwelcome news was reaching far into China, Murdoch obliged and kicked the BBC off his satellite. His reward was not long in coming. The Murdoch organization has since linked up with the People's Daily, the mouthpiece of the Beijing regime, to sell information technology in China. As part of the deal, Murdoch is believed to have offered the Chinese government smart card technology that would allow television programs to be vetted before being broadcast. Ninety percent of all the world's news comes from a handful of powerful Western sources. 
three agencies, Associated Press, Reuters, and Agence France Press, dominate our foreign news. Reuters and AP now make huge profits selling financial and corporate information. Once they had proud records as news gatherers, today their newsrooms are centers of the free market crusade. AP gets most of its funding from American outlets and devotes most of its coverage to the United States. The former president of Tanzania, Julius Nereri, once dry dryly suggested that the people of his country should be allowed to take part in the elections for president of the United States because they are bombarded with as much information about the candidates as Americans are. <laughs> Yet only 1% of the news broadcast on the main American TV networks is about Africa. In television, there are just hu two huge agencies providing foreign news to all the world's newsrooms, Reuters Television and World Network Television, WTN. Reuters supplies 400 broadcasters in 85 countries, reaching an audience of half a billion people. Perhaps even more than Murdoch, the American company CNN, which is owned by the billionaire Ted Turner, is the model of the information age. Now, CNN, as you'll remember, made its reputation with its round-the-clock coverage of the Gulf War. It was CNN that we saw relayed both on ITV and BBC during that war. Indeed, who can forget the lit-up skies over Baghdad coming to us live and the, exciting, the excited commentators describing the accuracy of the new smart weapons and the preciseness of the surgical strikes so precise that missiles could go around corner, corners and so smart that they could distinguish bad people from good people. And we actually saw it happening on TV, or rather we thought we did. The message was certainly clear that war at last had become a science. And this was a war, according to the independent newspaper, with miraculously few casualties. Long after the Gulf War, I remember quite vividly one surreal moment from television. I was slumped in front of the television late one night watching the BBC's arts program, The Late Show, which happened to be devoting an issue to foreign, corres uh, an addition to vo foreign correspondents talking about their adventures in the Gulf War. As each one of them spoke, the background filled with images from the war itself, mostly tanks and artillery and missiles flashing in the night. And quite suddenly, the scene, the backdrop changed. <clears throat> and there were bulldozers at work. And, while, and the reporter's monologue was overwhelmed by shocking pictures they couldn't see behind them. Driven by American soldiers, the bulldozers were pushing thousands of bodies into mass graves. Many of the bodies were crushed as if they'd been run over. Now, to my knowledge, the BBC's subversive blink was the only time the British public was allowed to see the true extent of the slaughter in the Gulf. The nature of the crime committed in the Gulf was never stated in the media. In the same way that 20 years after the war in Vietnam, it is extremely unusual to see or read in the media the truth that the United States attacked Vietnam, not went to save it. In the Gulf, as in Vietnam, the mass murder of people was passed off as tragic, perhaps even a mistake. Both were described as noble crusades. Last week, the, the Guardian carried a small item that said that only 8% of the weapons used in the Gulf War were so-called smart weapons, that the majority were what they call old-fashioned dump bombs. And we now know that most of them miss their military targets, killing thousands of men, women, and children many of them the very sheer and curd minorities that the West claimed to be defending. Those famous video pictures of American missiles blowing up Iraqi missile sites were all fake. Not a single Iraqi Scud site was destroyed. Millions of people dependent on Western satellite television were lied to or the truth was simply left out. A total of 147 Allied soldiers died in the Gulf, most of them by accident. According to the most reliable studies, 
200,000 Iraqis died during and immediately after the Allied attack, most of them civilians. This was never news. The media illusion of a clean scientific war had triumphed, or rather, the unthinkable had been normalized. Now, the fact that the war continues today against the children of, of Iraq is also not news. The deaths of some 50,000 Iraqi children every year as a, as a result of American and British-led sanctions is off the media agenda. It simply isn't news. And the fact that the, these sanctions are imposed in order to keep the price of oil in Saudi, uh, in Saudi Arabia artificially low is also not of interest. I believe that one of the basic functions of the modern high-tech media is to normalize the unthinkable. This term comes from a fine essay by Edward Herman called The Banality of Evil. And for those who wish to know more about the modern media, I recommend it highly. As Herman wrote, and I quote, doing terrible things in an organized and systematic way rests on normalization. There is usually a division of labor in doing and rationalizing the unthinkable with the direct brutalizing and killing done by one set of individuals and others working on improving technology such as weapons or a new kind of napalm. But it is the function of the mainstream media to normalize the unthinkable for the general public." Unquote. Of course, this is not a new concept. Take the reporting of the Cold War. When President Kennedy declared in 1960 that there was a missile gap with the Soviet Union, his message was carried without question in the Western media. In fact, the opposite was true. America was actually well ahead in missile development, but Kennedy's successful propaganda gave new impetus to the Cold War. When the British government used Australia to test its nuclear weapons in the 1950s, the British and American the British and Australian media accepted the lie that the tests were safe <clears throat> and, that no, and that no one was living in the, the test site when the bombs were exploded. In fact, many Aboriginal people lived there. The maps, which I saw later, had uninhabited stamped across them. More than that, the media actually celebrated, as I well remember, the contamination of the land and human lives as what they call progress. The front page of the now extinct Daily Graphic in London said, a new nuclear future dawns for all of us. When President Johnson unleashed American bombers on North Vietnam in 1964, he did so only after the media had helped him to sell to Congress a cock and bull story that communist gunboats had attacked American ships in the seas off North Vietnam. On the basis of this lie, the greatest bombing in history followed, legitimizing the American invasion and the carnage of the next 10 years in which at least 3 million people lost their lives. At the height of the pointless slaughter during the First World War, the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George told the editor of The Guardian, C.P. Scott, if the public knew the truth, the war would end tomorrow, but they don't know and they can't know. Not a great deal has changed in principle. During the Falklands War in 1982, Margaret Thatcher's war, a plan put forward by Peru for a negotiated settlement with Argentina came close to success. How close, the public never knew. On May the 13th, 1982, Edward Heath told News at 10 that the Argentines had requested three minor amendments to the peace plan. The amendments were so minor, said Heath, that they couldn't possibly be rejected. But Thatcher rejected them, and the story died. And the invasion went on. Indeed, that brief interview with Heath was the only occasion on television news, both ITN and BBC, that reference was made to the Argentine amendments and the British government having a case to answer. ITN later claimed that 70% of the British public were in, for, in favor of an invasion. But it left, what it left out from the same poll was that 76% wanted the United Nations to occupy the Falklands while Britain and Argentina negotiated. That was never news. 
During the miners' strike a few years later, television took on almost a Falklands role, with the miners often cast as the argies. Picket line violence was the main media issue. When the strike was over, the National Council for Civil Liberties produced a report on the role of the police. The report said that, and I quote, contrary to the impression given by the media, most of the picketing during the strike had been orderly and on a modest scale. This was not reported. Today there's another so-called debate going on about the future of the BBC's well service under John Burt. Anybody with a sense of decency opposes Burt's vandalism and his dismantling of the well service. But what there's never been is a real debate about the myths surrounding the BBC as a public broadcaster, especially the one that it's touched by the beauty of truth, impartiality and fair play. The BBC was started by John Reith, Lord Reith, while he was an enthusiastic propagandist for the Baldwin government during the general strike in the 1920s. To Reith, impartiality in broadcasting was a principle to be, to be suspended whenever the establishment was threatened. Well, that holds true today. You need only look closely at the television coverage of the great upheavals of the last 10 or 15 years. The Falklands War, the miners' strike, Wapping, the Gulf War, the poll tax island. To see how faithfully the BBC has followed the Reithian code and how often with great subtlety and secrecy the unthinkable has often been normalized. For example, during the Falklands War, I was sent minutes of the BBC's weekly review board meeting, a highly important top-level discussion of senior BBC executives. Now, these clearly showed those senior BBC executives directing that the reporting of the war be shaped, and I quote, to suit the emotional sensibilities of the public, and that the weight of BBC coverage should be concerned with government statements of policy and that an impartial style was felt to be, and I quote again, an unnecessary irritation. Since the present Irish war began in 1968, several hundred major programs on Ireland have been banned, censored, doctored, and delayed. From 1988, broadcast institutions and journalists accepted the outrageous censorship using actors' voices to blunt and demonize those who could have then played a part in peace and justice in Ireland. Even during the recent ceasefire, the British government's propaganda model was strictly adhered to. The underlying issues, such as poverty and the IUC's policing methods, were ignored. Decommissioning was made into a false issue, one which probably led the IRA to break the ceasefire. No mention was ever made of security force weaponry and the re-fortification of military institutions, um, installations. No mention was made of the increased intimidation of the people of Cross Maglen once the threat of the IRA was removed. The fact that the Labour Party under Blair radically changed its policy to fit exactly with that of the government was never an issue upon which Blair was ever vigorously challenged by journalists. These days there's a sort of fantasy world in the reporting of politics in this country. TV, newspapers and radio are filled with a sort of political, daily political soap. Will John Major last the distance? Why does Tony Blair smack his children? What will Jack Straw say today that is more authoritarian than what he said yesterday? Pointless verbal fisticuffs are conducted on BBC radio and television with Gordon Brown and Kenneth Clark who agree on everything except their God-given right to power. The Scott Inquiry provided the ammunition, but who apart from Paul Foote and one or two others have ever fired it? There is a new working class in this country that is being ruthlessly shaped by new forces of capital. But who in the mainstream media ever explains this? The consensus media view is that everyone is middle class now, apart from a small, irritating group known as the underclass. 
I do think it's time journalists did something about this. I know that there are many journalists who are troubled by their own place in the so-called media society, but are also worried about their jobs. There's no suggestion here of a conspiracy. Journalists are no different from historians and teachers in internalizing the priorities and fashions of power and of minimizing the culpability of power. But it's surely time that those journalists who work in the great media institutions analyze the myths and assumptions that influence everything they do, and that they begin to clear away the ideological rubble that buries so much real news and truth about the world. Ordinary journalists may not have the power of Murdoch or Burt, of course, but they are not powerless. They might begin by seeing themselves as agents of people, not agents of power, as participants, not innocent bystanders. In their own organizations, they can challenge, they can argue, and they can, if it comes, comes to it, refuse. For instance, they can reclaim the language that is so casually abused these days, Words like reform and free market and democracy have become Orwellian jag jargon that cry out, cry out for decoding, not parroting. Take the word moderate, an old favorite that has long neatly divided those people acceptable and unacceptable to the establishment. Trade unionists are notoriously categorized in this way still. In the 1930s, the US government described Hitler as a moderate, standing between left and right in Germany. So was Mussolini a moderate, and Saddam Hussein was a moderate. Suharto, one of the great butchers of the late 20th century, is still called a moderate. <laughs> Journalists use the, term, the terms globalization, humanitarian intervention, and preventative diplomacy as if they mean what they say. But what these, <coughs> what, what these vital, what <coughs> but what these are are vital propaganda terms euphemisms of a new imperialism, an imperialism that is seeking the same control over people and resources as ever before, but an imperialism that dares not speak his name. The word, of course, is never used. We have much to learn from journalists who struggle in a very different world from this one. I have many friends among them. One friend Ahmed Taufik is an Indonesian journalist who practices a sort of brave, non-conformist journalism that is faced with extinction in Britain. When Suharto closed down what was left of the liberal press in Jakarta, Taufik and his colleagues set up their own magazine called The Independent, a daring act in a country where free speech is against the law and dissenters are often murdered by the state. When I asked him if he was afraid, he said, people will support us, and they did. They bought the brave paper in their thousands, and last year they crowded the courtroom where Taufik and his colleagues were sent to prison for three years for publishing an article that merely analyzed the political situation in Indonesia uncritically. He must have known this would happen, and I offer his principled audacity as an example to journalists in the West who are not in fear of their lives. Perhaps I'm aiming these remarks at young journalists who too often, it seems to me, affect a sort of contrived, eclectic indifference which they confuse as sophistication and which they believe ordains them as real journalists. Some of them are convinced, sadly, that the public are apathetic and don't give a damn. They really should understand that the good journalist never takes refuge in cynicism, but persuades the readers to give a damn. I suppose my point is that people do give a damn and have a right to a press and a broadcasting that is theirs. I've been a journalist since I was 17 years old, and one thing I've had to learn is that people are always ahead of the media. These are the people who supported the miners, who supported the health workers and the postal workers, who have sustained the Liverpool dockers, who refuse to pay the poll tax, who oppose going to war in the Gulf, and a majority in this, in this country did, though this was hardly reported, 
and who despair that politics should be misrepre misrepresented as a choice between Tweedledum Major and Tweedledee Blair. So I offer the following as a media, sort of media survival kit for young journalists and anyone else interested. Beware false objectivity, the kind that promotes an establishment agenda. Robert Louis Stevenson, not a known radical, as far as I can tell, but he once described, quote, those sham impartialists, wolves in sheep's clothing, simpering honestly as they suppress. Beware all news from official sources. As the great muckraker Claude Coburn once said, never believe anything until it's officially denied. <laughs> Beware the pack. Never follow fashion in news. The stories crying out to be done are the ones almost always passed over. Recently, the Burmese democracy leader Aung San Suu Kyi told me that her country and the epic struggle of its people had fallen victim to the fickle fashion of Western news. Beware all background briefings, especially from politicians. Indeed, try to avoid, where possible, all contact with politicians. <laughs> that way you find out more about them. <laughs> Certainly never go to work for them. Campaign to abolish the lobby system completely. Beware celebrating technology until you find out who controls it. The internet is brilliant, of course it is, but its most fervent bedfellows are the American government and a cluster of multinational companies whose message posting is outstripping all others. Have nothing to do with what are known as denotices. Go to jail if necessary. And always understand that all journalism, all journalism, should be investigative, be it politics, economics, sport, the lot. And finally, take pride in the knowledge that the media barons can't stand the sight of us journalists. Rupert Murdoch's contempt for journalists is well known, and Conrad Black's regard for his journalists, for journalists, is as follows. Black, of course, is the one who owns the Daily Telegraph here and newspapers and television stations all over the world and likes to boast that he's even more right-wing than Murdoch. The trouble with journalists, says Black, <coughs> is that their mental stability is open to question. <laughs> they are ignorant, lazy, and inadequately supervised. <clears throat> and they depend on stifling and depraved gossip and the, falling, and the fawning of hucksters and unfulfilled women. <laughs> Unquote. The women journalists, I suppose, depend on unfulfilled men. Alas, he named names, and I confess, not without pride, that mine was one of them. Right, comrades, I, I want to say something um, about the, the much vaunted role of spin doctors who, uh, who have become a kind of a fashionable trend, and we're always hearing about like the Labour Party's spin doctors and how powerful they are, these people sit in a little room somewhere down in Walworth Road, and they phone up the BBC, and they phone up the papers, and magically, you know, the words of Tony Blair appear in the papers and on screen, and, and there's a sort of a mythology that arises around these people that, that they're somehow firstly manipulating the media and secondly by doing that controlling what people think and I, I just want to um, it, it sort of say a couple of things about that sadly for my sins I've been uh, working in a press office until last Thursday um, and being in that situation, albeit at a much, much lower level, I think you, you learn a little bit about who does and who doesn't actually control the media and control what goes into it. Firstly, just to, just to deal with, um, with um, the sort of, you know, the big political kind of spin doctors like Mandelson and, and what's his name, is it Alistair Campbell, uh, Blair's press secretary? You know, you, you hear all this stuff about how Alistair Campbell's got a, a, a bit for Blair in the sun, half a page of, of, of Tony Blair says whatever. And I just think it's very important for comrades to remember, firstly, that, you know, who actually owns the media. You know, the Rupert Murdoch's the, and, and, and so on that, 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 that John Pilger was talking about. But, but secondly, actually, I think if we suggest that Alistair Campbell is, is, is directing it, we're putting the cart before the horse. 
I think we need to recognise that, that, that Blair in, Blairism is a phenomenon, that Blair is someone who is out to prove to the ruling class that, that he can do a good job of, uh, of, uh, of, of making sure that, that Britain stays you know, or, or gets profitable or something and, and keep the workers under wraps. A lovely little relationship has been going on. Tony Blair's flown off to go and see Rupert Murdoch. You know, they sit down and have dinner. Rupert Murdoch's very interested in Tony Blair. That's actually why Tony Blair is getting space in the sun. You know, if Tony Cliff could, uh, could offer something really useful to Rupert Murdoch, he'd probably get half a page in the sun as well. For obvious reasons, you know, it, 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 it doesn't work like that. The second thing that I, I just want to say is, the, the other thing that I think we need to bear in mind is that people's ideas are not wholly shaped by the media. They're not wholly shaped by what gets pumped out from, you know, from, from offices and, and people's political phone calls and stuff. They're actually shaped, you know, by... by or obviously people get a lot of ideas from the media, but, but those ideas can clash with the ideas that we get from reality. I have been working in Hackney Council's press office. It's a very, very sad job, to be honest. It's, it's the, the most socially useless job you could possibly do for, for a council is sit on the phone and explain to journalists, or try and explain to journalists, why shutting libraries is a good idea. This is supposed to be improving the image of the council, and because we weren't doing it well enough, um, that's why I stopped last Thursday. And in between... <laughs> And in between that, you know, we find them sort of recruiting private consultants at £300 a day. He actually was called a, a spin doctor, a nasty bloke called Neil Martinson with lots of local Labour Party connections as it goes. You know, because they think these people are going to change the council's image. I'll tell you, it's bollocks. There must be people here who live in Hackney or have been to Hackney. You know that the council houses are falling down. You know they're being sold off to the private sector. You know that seven libraries have shut. You know that a school is shut. You know that Meals on Wheels are being replaced by frozen dinners. People in Hackney know know that and that reality will always conflict with whatever garbage people, people pump out to the press and, the, and, and I, I really want to finish there, I think we need to bear in mind that actually we can challenge uh, where these people are coming from, they don't exist in isolation from society they're part of a, of a class system they're part of, uh, they're part of the, 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 the politics that are, are built on that actually we can challenge those ideas and one of the worst things I think about it is that he uses, and the Labour leadership, use this whole argument that the media is all powerful, therefore we've got to get into the media, therefore people shouldn't fight back, we've got to be respectable, we've got to, you know, um, you know not, not, not go on strike, we've got to make sure we don't go on demonstrations and so on and so forth. They use that as an argument against anyone who wants to fight back. And the problem is that reinforces the, the, the power of ruling class ideas, I think. Because I think ruling class ideas are at their strongest when people on the ground are passive, are atomised, when we're just going about our everyday life, you know, and we don't see any sort of alternative. I think when, when ruling class ideas, the media's sort of ideas, can be challenged best is when people are fighting back and beginning to look for some sort of alternative. The last time there was any, you know, really serious wave of, of working class struggle, you know, massive wave of working class struggle in this country in the early 70s, the media, you know, as it always does, Ha, ran a massive campaign against strike action, against militants and so on and so forth. It just didn't work. It ended up in a situation where the Sun newspaper actually had to support the miners' strike in 1974 that brought down the Tory government because it was such a popular strike. And it ended up in a situation as well where workers began to produce their own media, to be honest, because they were so fed up with the kind of lies that were being produced. You know, there were rank-and-file newspapers produced. Even the TUC actually had to produce... Um, an alternative news service because it was demanded by the rank and file to counter the lies of the media. And best of all, that wave of strike action in the early 70s had its impact on the media itself. You had a situation when the Dockers went on strike in 1972. Yeah, I'm finishing now. When the Dockers went on strike in 1972, one of the very first things they did was to march up to Fleet Street down the road, go and talk to the shop stewards in Fleet Street, and after 24 hours of arguing, they got the printers out on strike and they stopped the media's lies. You see, the, there is an argument that the media is all-powerful and we're not going to change society because people are duped by the media and they won't fight back. But as uh, the last speaker said, that's not true. And if you think about the fact that the majority of Sun readers vote Labour and not Tories, as it's a Tory paper, um, you, can, you can understand that. And I think it is clear that if people, if, you know, everyone knew what we know tonight and what we've been told by John 
Pilger tonight, we may be, well be in a better position to change society because people would understand more the ruthless drive for profit of the ruling class. And yet, despite the fact that people don't know this, they do fight back. Um, you've got the postal workers on strike now, and I talked to one, and he was saying that, you know, a lot of people in his post office read The Sun, and they were reading that, oh, they've just turned down a 15% pay rise, full stop. And they can see quite clearly that that's not true, and there's, you know, there's a lot more to it than that. You have also uh, The Sun reporting on the Hillsborough tragedy, and a lot of people in Liverpool, after their uh, terrible reporting, refused to buy The Sun. So those two factors, I think, the fact that the, the media is owned by and large by the ruling class, and the other fact that despite this, workers do fight back. I think that's the reason why paper like Socialist Worker is so important, really, because it not only tells us what the Tories are up to and how corrupt and, uh, and they are, it not only tells us how uh, Labour are complicit in that and how, what the Labour Party are up to, but it also tells, it supports all working class struggles, so that workers who read Socialist Worker know what, how, you know, the, uh, of other struggles that other workers uh, are fighting Can and really now, it's I mean it's a tool that is essential really for for us to organize and uh, and, f and have a be in a better position to fight back and fight for a better society John Pilger referred to the lamentable coverage by the media of the Falklands war and of course that you know is absolutely absolutely the case uh, but of course it's a site easier for them uh, to get away with that kind of coverage, given the fact that the Labour Party didn't do anything to oppose it. You know, if they'd have been getting up in Parliament and speaking out against the Fulton's War, then obviously it would have been much harder um, for them to give the totally one-sided view, and the same goes for Ireland as well. And what I want to address is the question that's already been touched upon, is about really how and to what extent do the media succeed in duping people, because the point has been made that it is easier for the media to mislead and distort things when it comes to subjects which you know, people don't have direct experience of and don't feel familiar with. And that's why, as socialists, we do say that the struggle is the key, really, in challenging the power of the media. And I'm called to mind an example from my workplace, the Sheffield uh, Star, where there was a strike last summer uh, by the library workers opposing uh, attempts by the council to change their terms and conditions. And the star ran editorials attacking them for being on strike and distorting what was going on and refusing to put over their view and union spokespeople weren't getting their point of view into the paper. And uh, despite all of that, the, the strike won. And so the local Unison branch thought that they put uh, an advert in the paper saying uh, that, you know, victory to the library workers, come along to a meeting to celebrate it type of thing. And the management at the newspaper in their wisdom decided that they couldn't run that advert because that was just the union's opinion that it was a victory and you know they weren't into <laughs> it's funny isn't it you know you sell these adverts for cars you know it goes faster it's better you know best carpets whatever it is but you can't, if you can't have an opinion if you're you're in a trade union the great thing was that the library workers converged outside the Sheffield Star office and they're all chanting liar 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 outside the editor's office and uh, one of them had a I had a placard down there and it said, I thought this was brilliant, uh, Twinkle, Twinkle, Sheffield Star, now we see just what you are. Um, you know, li likewise, on the, you know, another example of where struggle um, in the miners' strike, thinking back to the miners' strike, I mean, people say, what's the best front page the Sun ever did? Uh, was it Freddie Starrett, My Hamster, and all that sort of rubbish? But the best front page ever did by a mile was the one that was blanked out by the NGA when they tried to print a picture of Scargill. Uh, and that's an example that we can still look to. I think it's easy to criticize journalists for what, um, what you don't think isn't reported, but I think it's also important to realize that, as John Pilger mentioned, that many journalists are stuck in jobs where they're compelled by their, newspaper, news, their newspaper's party line to report what is demanded of them. For example, this past spring, because I'm writing a thesis about journalists at the five national broadsheets, which are the Times, Guardian, Financial Times, Daily Telegraph, and The Independent, I interviewed them about what, what they thought about homelessness and the big issue and what their coverage was of those topics. What is really frightening is I found that, unlike my expectations, not all reporters at the conservative papers were specifically conservative reporters, and also most of the reporters I spoke with said they were really constrained 
by what was demanded of them by their editors. For example, several journalists I talked to from the Times, one of the questions I asked them, I asked them 14 questions. I said, what do you find is the biggest challenge about being a journalist? One young reporter about my age at the time said, my biggest challenge is to justify to people why I work for something published by Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> <laughs> but what is also really disturbing is that I asked them, when they get ideas about homelessness to write about, what are the editor's response to those? Um, the same reporter at the Times, he saw an article on the big issue about kids who um, take their methadone prescriptions and vomit them and in turn sell them to other kids who are addicted to them. He proposed this idea to editors at the Times and they just laughed at his face. What I also found, I spoke with other journalists at the other papers, including the Daily Telegraph. One, report, one reporter told me, quote, homelessness isn't a sexy item. Our readers don't want to hear about it. But what I also found surprisingly is that a lot of journalists are really constrained about what to write. For example, you might think that journalists at papers like the Daily Telegraph might be very conservative themselves. What I found is specifically one young woman about my age again who described herself as very leftist. She, she talked about the party line that she hated and she told me about about her job. She works during the day at the Daily Telegraph, reports what is expected of her, and at night promptly leaves for her second job in an alternative London magazine. So I think what I'd like to point out is that not all journalists are just unthinking people, just writing, just continually, just, you know, not listening to society. Many are constrained in their jobs, and that's why I think it's important that groups like the SWP not only support these journalists because they understand what's going on in society, but quite frankly, it's very competitive and they have to keep their jobs. So it's important that we not only support them, but there also needs to be the need for alternative papers like the Socialist Worker, which reports things that we don't often see in the mainstream media. Journalists and broadcasters can be and should be the guardians of history. The best write history's first draft. Ed Murrow, the great American reporter, repels smear upon smear in his reporting of the McCarthy witch hunts in the United States. Martha Gellhorn reported the disaster of the Great Depression from the point of view of its victims in the heartland of America. James Cameron broke the silence over the Korean War and expose the atrocities on our side. Morgan Phelps Price, the Guardian's man in Moscow in 1917, was damned as a traitor for reporting the Allied invasion that did its best to strangle the revolution at birth, and there are many more like them. The great essayist, Raymond Williams, once referred to those writers and journalists who, as he put it, endlessly harp about the end of idealism. This is all they have, he wrote, with which to defend this social order, not that it's good, but that it's inevitable. Nothing is inevitable. It is possible to read between the lines, as my Czech friend advised long ago, but it's hard to do that as an isolated individual. It can be done in communication and solidarity with others. As for those of us in the media, I suggest we listen to the wisdom of a, a primary school teacher, Pat Hartington, who stood up at her union's conference and called on her colleagues to protect children from the onslaught of government policies. She said, and I quote, the future is in our hands whether we change the law or not, because by resisting we will refine, by subverting we will redirect, and by protecting we will create, and in doing so we remain loyal to the principle that the learner and truth and equality come first. I can add nothing to that. Thank you. <laughs>